Are we are ready to hear you? Excellent. Well, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, with, with us, I want to, uh, Dr. Khaled, uh, Khaled also with us. We'll okay. speak after. Of course, yeah. Well, Hello. good morning, everyone. Good opportunity. Yep. Cornea okay. Club uh, doing this joint meeting with the Syrian Ophthalmology Society. And um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome my panelists. So today we're going to present some cases. Uh, I don't know how many we can do. Um, we prepared for four. We could do less depends on the time. Um, so I've got a very excellent panelist, some of the top people in Cornea in the United Kingdom, and yourself, Dr. Anas from Syria. So I, I start with uh, uh, Mr. Shiraz Daya. He is a consultant ophthalmologist, a founder, and the chairman of Center for Sight. Shiraz actually was my mentor when I did my Cornea training, uh, and I learned a lot of him. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from his tips today. Um, Moving next to Damien Lake, uh, Mr. Damien Lake, he's a, a very dear colleague. We work together at Queen Victoria Hospital, uh, an amazing surgeon, amazing uh, mind <laughs> with the cornea, and I'm sure we'll again learn from his tips. And uh, moving to Alan Parsam, so uh, Mr. Alan Parsam, he's, uh, he's, he consulted in Luton Dunstable, ophthalmologist. Uh, he's, uh, he's also founder and one of the pioneers uh, in cornea refractive surgery. Actually, he did, he did the first conductive keratoplasty in the world surgery. And uh, Alan, the, uh, he's the founder also of the OCL, which is Ophthalmology Consultants of London. Uh, Alan, very smart chap. I always uh, listen to him talking. He's always got uh, great angles and approach to, to management. Um, and of course, we have you, Dr. Anas. Uh, Dr. Anas, you are known to your audience uh, as the president of Syria Ophthalmology Society. So, uh, uh, great honor to have you all. I have uh, Artemis Matsu. Artemis, uh, she's our senior cornea fellow, and uh, she will help me today. She prepared the cases. Thank you, Artemis, for your hard work on this. And she's going to present it. And throughout, we will be like uh, uh, pausing and discussing, asking the, the panel various questions. Is that okay with you? So that's from me for now. Uh, hi, good morning everyone. Um, I'll just start with the first case, which is on keratoconus management. And that's a quite common case that we all come across every day in clinic. So a 16-year-old male patient with keratoconus, he has the typical background of hay fever, asthma, eczema, and he's an eye rubber as well. He's tried contact lenses, but he's intolerant and he's actually tried several uh, types, as you can see. And he was referred to us for progressive keratoconus in both eyes. So in terms of his um, uh, baseline information, his uncorrected visual acuity was 638 in the right eye. Best corrected with contact lens, which he does not tolerate though, is 619. This is his refraction, so he has a quite high uh, manifest uh, astigmatism. And this is his corneal scan, so an asymmetric bow tie uh, keratoconus with high keratometric astigmatism and a K-max value of uh, 57.6. Good. Excellent. No. Um, the left eye as well, yeah? So left eye, uh, less affected, uncorrected visual acuity 612, best corrected with contact lens is 69.5, less manifest astigmatism here, and you can see the scan, so symmetric bow tie but uh, catatonic uh, eye. And uh, these are the issues that we're dealing with now. So we have a young 60-year-old, 16-year-old uh, patient, catatonic, with an eye rubber, he's got atopy, He's contact lens intolerant. Obviously, he wants to have clear vision. He's very active and he's got progression. Okay. So I, I think this is the first question to ask. When would you consider doing cornea cross-linking for this chap? He's 16, he's young. He's he got high risk, obviously. I rubber, atopic background. So um, probably asthma, eczema as well. Um, so really asking the panel, when would you cross linking? Do you just jump in and do it or are you going to wait for progression and see him in six months, etc.? Who want to jump on the answer? Oh, well, as, as soon as he consents to it. Okay. But what if, what if he's too young to consent? So say, say he, was, he was 14 years old. And then he can still consent if he, if he understands the issues or we speak to his parents. Okay, so, uh, so, so the I'll, first I'll go ahead and cross yeah. the as soon as possible. Both. Yeah. So, you, mm -hmm. so really, the the question is here: you don't gonna wait. Is that because the age you're gonna cross him straight away, or because you think it's advanced case and uh, there's no point waiting? Well, he's gonna progress. So why would you wanna wait for him to progress? 
Excellent. So we cross link him, consenting if he can't make decision. Obviously, parents can jump in and do that. Excellent. Right. So, um, so that's what thought, we did, right? Yeah. I'm allowed to. I, I thought. I always thought philosophically, it's a silly, it's a silly view to wait for a condition to progress, and then treat when you know that you that treatment is not going to make things any better. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's just one of those uh, silly bureaucratic things that was taken up by the um, by the authorities yeah. in the UK. Therefore. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're right. I agree with you, Damien. Yeah, they extended something from a clinical trial, which was obviously the original clinical trials to show that it stopped progression. And then they, they use that as a philosophical point to not use the treatment until there's progression, which is, it's silly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it should be revoked, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. Okay, so Artemis, what we did here. So regarding consent, actually, this is a 16-year-old uh, patient who, in the UK, he's, he's okay to consent for himself. I think he's done all the consenting himself uh, action on that occasion. And we proceeded, as we said, with, uh, as, as all our speakers said. So right eye plan was to do femtosecond assisted intraconal ring uh, segment implantation. And that's because he was very keen on visual rehabilitation as well. And then at second, second stage to do cross-linking. And left eye, because there was progression there as well, we just decided to proceed with cross-linking only. So that's what he had. Uh, right eye, two segments, intax at six millimeter optic zone, 160 uh, degree arc length at uh, 350 microns thickness for the ring segments, and depth of implantation was 400 microns uh, thick. So on okay. the... Mm -hmm. so can I just say, when would you do cornea rings for these patients? <laughs> When would you cornea ring? Consider you doing cornea ring for the patient. <clears throat> I think my first question is: is why did you cross link afterwards and not beforehand? There's, I know it's controversial. I, I do it the other way around, but but I, I'm just interested in the panel's views uh, or, or your views, uh, Samir. Uh, if you conducted this, why did you do? Why did you cross link afterwards? The only reason why I cross link beforehand is I see patients who, uh, for second opinions, who've had cross linking after. Uh, rings and they've had problems with extrusion and, and 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 other issues and infections and so on. So I'm not sure it's a you know I'm not sure one causes the other, but I, I don't think it's a great idea. Apart from the else, sometimes I find if I cross link them, I don't need to do rings because they they get the best corrected acuity improves. Yeah, but personally, Shiraz, I agree with you. We always do, I do always cross link first because as I said, they might get better and then you don't need to do do rings. And plus, as you said, when they have cross linking. Uh, sorry, ring first, they have more keratocyte activities, and then you cross link them, then you can instill more inflammation, and you're right, more uh, ring related issues. Um, uh, the problem is sometimes here, as you know, in NHS, these patients are NHS patients, sometimes you have no waiting list issues, so you end up doing one or the other. So that's the main thing. I think that's not really um, justification, but that's how it works in this guy. Um, but if you go back, uh, Artemis, to the scan, the I we did the cross link, uh, sorry, the ring. Mm -hmm. So I think the logic here was his vision is not improved in that eye, and we try to improve reg corneal regularity from whatever 638, 619, uh, to improve, pot increase potential of vision. So that's why the option was to do ring in the right eye. While the other eye, the left eye, uh, if you go next slide. Mm -hmm. So the left eye actually got good reason on vision. He can get to 69.5, so we don't want to do ring. So the logic was just to improve corneal regularity, increase his potential of vision. I think this is a good message probably to also various colleagues, especially um, people who practice cornea and doing rings, that actually we shouldn't be so enthusiastic about putting rings in those patients because we know rings, plastics in the eye, not always good results. You might get a lot of problems with them. Um, fine, let you continue, Artemis. Can I just ask you a question? Can you continue? Yeah. I mean, no, do you uh, choose always a six millimeter uh, corneal ring or just for this case? Yeah, no, we personally we choose either five or six millimeter, depends on the case. I think that case was done quite in the past where we, we used to do intacts only. Obviously, now we do more Ferrara ring, six and five millimeter. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the main reason why we've done that that time. I think the uh, other issue, the, the yeah. other issue with this chap was that um, he's a young guy with a very large pupil. So I think that was the reason mm -hmm. for the larger optical zone. I think 
preferentially looking at that topography, mm -hmm. it would have been better to do a five millimeter Kerr ring, but um, to get the maximum effect. But due to his pupil size, he ended up with a six. So if this he patient you see him today, right. Damien, would you do five millimeter ring Ferrara if you see, if you've seen him now? Um, I would say that the chances of a six millimeter ring having an appreciable effect is not as great as a five millimeter ring having an appreciable effect, but mm. it's more likely to get glare. And mm. I mean, some of those guys I've treated by just giving them pilocarpin afterwards to make the pupil small. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's worked to some effect. Mm. Um, a lot of them are highly tolerant of a lot of glare anyway, because, you know, with the keratoconus, they're used to high aberrations. And, and these guys are very uncomplaining and, and get on with it, as, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody with uh, a mild bit of dry eye and a multifocal ring, who apparently it can end their life. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's amazing how tolerant keratoconus patients are. Exactly. So I, I, would, I would probably give him the option. Okay. Alan, do you have different views on this? I'm just curious, when, when this patient was best corrected with his contact lens, did anyone have a look at what it, whether the pinhole acuity improved further? Yes, I'm sure we did. I think it, it was slightly better, but I think it was uh, 612 at that stage. Because, I mean, I don't like diagnosing amblyopia and keratoconics because I do feel that normally it's the cornea that's culpable for their reduced visual acuity. But looking at this corneal shape you know it's quite a central cone it's it's an asymmetric um you know relatively regular looking bow tie i.e you see many keratoconics with a significantly greater amount of irregularity than this patient has and i'm just a bit surprised that with a contact lens or with a refraction that's the level of vision um so i i just wonder if this eye um may be a little bit amblyopic as well you know he's very young so obviously he's had keratoconus at a young age He's much more myopic in this eye with much more myopic astigmatism outside of the keratoconus. Um, and it's just, an, it's just a, an important consideration because you can end up going down the route of repetitive surgical interventions and aggressive surgical management on these patients when their potential for vision is limited anyway. Um, and, that, and I've been caught out once or twice with keratoconics when that happens. I just, I, that's just a point I think it's worth making. It's a difficult one. It's a difficult one because he's, he's very keen uh, to say that both of his eyes were normal in the past, and so is his mother. And, and in yeah. fact, they're, they're very unhappy that their opticians didn't pick it up earlier and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. Mm. So you're stuck in that sort of situation where what you're going to say, you, you can't not believe them. So, yeah. Mm. You know. Okay. Right, Artemis, let's see what happened next then. So talking about problems with intracornial ring segments, the first day it was noted that the edge of the temporal segment was actually broken with, inside the tunnel, so that had to be removed. Uh, treated with antibiotics, obviously, but over the next few days, he developed some infiltrates within the tunnels, affecting the nasal segment too. Uh, despite very intensive antibiotic treatment that didn't improve, uh, so there is progression of the infiltrates at this stage. And question is, what do we do? Do we continue treatment or do we remove? Mm. Okay. Dr. Samer. Hello, Dr. Khaled. Nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm very glad to I'm very glad to communicate with you through Syrian Ophthalmological Society. Uh, Dr. Saber, the case is so exciting. Now you know uh, here in Syria we have a lot of uh, spring catar and rapping eye. And this case is very common in our area. So uh, the important things we want to know, the conclusion, is it sufficient what uh, our guest lady did or you need to add uh, cross-linking for the next step or wait and observe and pray? Well, <laughs> a very good, good question. Well, obviously we've done cross-linking for him already. And um, I would say your point is very valuable because we should not really treat population the same way because I, as you said, you have a high risk group of patients who normally get, as you said, the, uh, the vernal disease or they got eye rubbers. And uh, plus sometimes they, your patient go, like come from long far away and you're not gonna see him necessarily afterwards, meaning that you're losing chance to diagnose problems. 
And uh, I would say we should have, if I'm practicing now in Syria, I will have a, uh, I'll be very reluctant to put rings in patients' eyes unless I see the definite improve, uh, potential of improvement. I'll, it won't be like my routine thing, I would say. So yeah, I will do a lot of praying as well. Okay. Question is, what would you, what would you uh, the, the, uh, We face these cases earlier. We may face it at the age of 10, 11, 12, because uh, acute attack of spring Qatar, and you know that well, during you seeing patients in Damascus and Syria, uh, should we do the same? No, Should I, we do I, the same in earlier age? I, I definitely cross link. I will. I cross link even here. I cross link children as early as the diagnosis. So no matter what the age, once I find the diagnosis confirmed, we cross link them straight away. So we don't want to wait. We're not gonna observe them. Uh, but as I said, for the ring itself, I'll be reluctant to insert rings in those patients' eyes, for sure. Do you, do, so the question was here, we, we done the rings and you can see this is a problem here. So this patient have infiltrate around the rings and uh, the ring is broken as well, but that's maybe this problem. Um, I don't know. Shiraz, would you just observe this uh, infiltrate or just take the ring I've, out? I've never seen, I mean, the biggest danger is that it could have a strange organism. I have to say, in all the times I've put in rings and treated complications, I've never seen infiltrates get better without removal. It's a simple thing to remove them and they, and because they have an entry point through the tunnel, the antibiotics really penetrate quite well. Mm. Uh, so I, I, but yet when you have a foreign body there, there's a lot that, that you know, where they've they got these bacteria sitting there with a glycocalyx around them, the, the interaction between the prosthetic and, a, and, and, and biological tissue is different. Get, mm -hmm. the, get the prosthetic out if you can, and it's very simple, and treat them. And you can always put a ring in later, and I've done that in, in, in the past as well. Excellent. Let's see next then. So the ring was removed, right? So indeed, uh, the ring was, uh, both rings actually were removed, both segments. And uh, uh, one week later, things are settling. Uh, there is some early uh, scarring, obviously, because of the uh, infection and the uh, tunnel creation. So we proceeded with the initial plan. Two months later, the patient had cross-linking, which was hypotonic transepithelial accelerated. And uh, a month after that, uh, there's already a flattening effect. However, visual rehabilitation is still an issue. So the patient is very unhappy with his vision and he remains contact lens intolerant. So oh, okay. mm -hmm. question at this stage is, what do you do for visual rehabilitation next? And whether you would consider uh, redoing intracorneal ring segments? What does a corneal topography look like? Uh, so much the same actually with the, I don't have it here, but it's much the same with the, with the baseline topography. I don't think there's any significant change in values, but I can um, later on show you the, the difference. Okay. Yeah. Can you go back to the, see what his current sit situation now with the vision like? So his vision is... After the cross -link didn't affect vision, the same, same vision again. So that's okay. uh, what he's now. So I'm correct is 638, best correct is 612. That's with contact lenses. Okay. But you cannot tolerate contact lenses. I can't I wear it. I'll ask you to uh, Dr. Anas. Thank you. The question, uh, Doctor, what is the uh, time between uh, cross linking and the uh, problem with uh, the ring? And uh, what about vision after removing the ring from the eye? Did you hear the question, Artemis? So no, you're no. asking what the time between cross-linking and the putting the ring? So uh, ring was done first, so was the yeah, complication, the... ring was removed. Two months after ring removal, we did the cross-linking. Now mm -hmm. we are at this stage where we're considering what to do with visual rehabilitation and we're now six months after cross-linking. So his vision has not changed, Dr. Anas. No. He's, vision... he's stable. And the, uh, the question is, what you do next? I mean, this is what we, yeah. Would, would you do rings again? To Alan's, to Alan's original point about 619 vision, the patient's actually improved now to 612. So they got better with the reduction in astigmatism. I'm not sure about this, uh, the contact lens uh, trial that they had, whether it was, it was good enough. You know, 
it, it seems that the patient is not necessarily ambiopic and actually got better. Mm. Just a, the, it's an interesting point because that suggests that he's got potential for, for good vision equivalent as uh, by history in both eyes. Mm. So he, he still is, I think the issue is he cannot wear the contact lenses because of various condition. That's his main issue. And that's actually, I will tell the patients, when we do rings, not always, <laughs> there's not an answer always because he, they might still need to wear contact lens afterwards. So um, they don't, I don't want to give, take, the, take, the, take the impression that actually if you have a cornea rings, that's it. You're not going to need the contact lenses afterwards. This is not the case. I hope you agree with that. Okay. So you've done the rings now. Or, uh, sorry, we're going to do another rings, Artemis? We did. And that's, okay. again, six months after cross-linking. And this time we chose Ferrara rings at 5 millimeter octazone, zone, 120 degrees arc length, 250 microns thickness, and depth of implantation was same, 400 microns. Okay. Right. Okay. How you did calculate the intra the ring after the when you will put the new segment? So much echo. Um, yes, the uh, we, we follow nomograms by the company AJL. They have a there is nomogram which where you put the data. It's uh, mainly following the Q value, um, but that's how, how we do it all the time. Uh, but, uh, obviously, different people do it different way in the calculation. You use no information of the cornea or the old information? We use information from the cornea, of course, yes. No, but the information which we, we, uh, we receive after the remove ring, it will be changed. So yeah, of course. Use... Yeah, yeah, no, of course. We, we look at the topography before the, the new implants. We feel the new rings and uh, those the information we feed it in the software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Next, Artemis. Yeah. Uh, so that's six months down the line after the inter the second attempt at intracornial ring second implantation. No complications this time. Uncorrected visual acuity has improved to six fifteen. Uh, remind me. Remind you. A presentation was six six thirty eight and best corrected with contact lens this time is six seven point five. So quite mm. good. Mm. Uh, however, he remains contact lens intolerant and he's still unhappy with his uh, uncorrected vision, essentially. <laughs> spectacle corrected vision. Uh, no, he's not tolerating spectacle correcting vision. He's, uh, he's unhappy with both, actually. Mm. Because if, if the vision was good with spectacles, then you could consider it, uh, an ICL if they're really that bad. But um, mm. if, they're, if they're really dependent on contact lenses, then that's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to show the change in keratometry values uh, before and after uh, the combination of cross-linking and uh, Ferrara ring. So he had a good improvement actually of nearly eight diopters down in his K-marks and four diopters in his keratometric astigmatism. Um, so at this point, the issues are that we have a patient, young one, with stable keratoconus, contact lens intolerant, with um, a fluctuation of his refraction and vision during his uh, visits. So that, that's a uh, quite important aspect, actually. He's got dry mm -hmm. eyes and allergies, and he's got some stroma scarring from the first uh, intracoronal ring segments. Mm -hmm. uh, again, visual rehabilitation is the question, and what would you advise we do next? Uh, how long after the rings is this patient? Uh, so uh, so that, that's now six months after the ring segment implantation the second time. Mm -hmm. So personally, you know, I find the atopic patients quite scary, especially when they're young. And I think you've heard me say that many times. I would leave them alone. And often you find that the cornea remodels over time after rings and they get, and the vision uh, continues to improve. At this age, 16, 17 years old, I, I'd be waiting before I do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, good point, Shiraz. I think that's, that's probably, <laughs> if time goes back, probably that was a good choice to wait a bit. Yeah. Um, don't know. I don't, as a refractive surgeon, surgeon with the massive experience, would you think there's anything laser-wise we can do to improve this regularity a little bit to make him kind of improve at least spectacle correction, be better? Um, not really when his eyes are dry. I mean, he needs, to be, he needs to be asymptomatic and he needs to have a good ocular surface. So, you know, I, trend, I tend to treat these patients quite aggressively medically before I do any intervention anyway. You know, I have a very low threshold for putting them on long-term cyclosporin, um, sometimes some steroid, 
um, you know, lubricants, punctual plugs, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I suppose if you did all of that and he had a good tear breakup time and he was motivated, um, mm -hmm. then you could look at um, couple graphic laser as an option. But I think it's highly unlikely that he would respond sufficiently to that medical treatment. Um, mm -hmm. He's also already exhibited a, an unusual bacterial response to an intervention that is normally free of infection. And you're then going to plan to give him, you know, another surface treatment with stromal treatment with eczema laser, where the where the where the risk of infection will be higher. Um, so I'd be very reluctant to intervene, but obviously, yes, it's an option that you could do a uh, you could do a corneal wavefront or topography driven, topography guided um, transepithelial PRK. I've, you know, I've done that in patients that have had intracorneal rings before with with um, with good mm -hmm. success. In fact, I would actually say that the variability in visual experience with an intracorneal ring segment is similar to the variability that you also get with topography guided laser so you might have argued that that what might have been a potential primary intervention um which you can combine with corneal cross-linking um but again mm. it's guaranteed unfortunately and yeah the, it's essential the ocular surface is good yeah results always unpredictable isn't it so what we've done our team is then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we actually did uh, uh, PTK, uh, 60 microns thickness and 7 millimeter optic zone and correcting a small fragment of his astigmatism as well. Um, so you can think of it, Alan, like a trans PRK in a way, yeah. We, we had treated quite aggressively his dry eye and his ocular allergies also, we thought. And uh, two months down the line, uh, mm -hmm. no, not much change in his vision uncorrected is 615 best corrected with contact lens is 67.5 and with his uh, spectacles that's what he achieved 612 so he's still unhappy he's now nearly 18 19 years old he's in college he's very active so he's um you need to like what's important to know in this case is that when when he achieves that 6 over 12 best spectacle corrected visual acuity is the quality of vision adequate for him and also is one of the complaints that he has when it's corrected either with spectacles or with a contact lens and isometropia because he's significantly more myopic in this eye. And if he finds that the quality of vision is okay with that six over 12, but he is anisometropic, providing he has an anterior chamber depth of 2.8 millimeters or more, then a toric ICL is a, is a potential option for him. Excellent. I would agree, yeah. But the, the, one of the things that I find very useful is to get the retinoscope out and take a look at the aberrations in these patients. Because, you know, you know there's a, only a limit to how much you can correct them unaided. And you're, you're, you're going down the wrong garden path here. If you think you're going to get them better vision with transepithelial PRK rings and so on and so forth, if you do a, 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 um, a retinoscopy and you can see they've got like double scissoring, They've got an irregular cornea. It doesn't matter what you do on those patients, it's going to be a problem. And um, it's either a contact lens or a scleral lens or a graft. And uh, uh, I think, uh, so I actually don't do rings off as often when I see that, when I take the retinoscope by and take a look. So it's something to think about. Because you, mm. you're, you're, you're kidding yourself and kidding the patient too, if you think you're going to give them good vision, good vision mm. means six, nine or better uh, with all these interventions. Good points. Uh, just also to, Reconfirm what uh, Alan was saying. The ICL is for the patient to improve with the glasses because I think often there is a misunderstanding. ICL is not for patient improve just with contact lenses. It's just purely for if they improve with glasses. Um, if they don't improve with glasses, then there's no point doing ICL for those patients. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Have we done ICL, Artemis? No, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't get him on a stable refraction. So every time the refraction was um, slightly different. And following a lot of discussions, we proceeded with a dulk for this patient. It's getting more surgical. Okay. <laughs> right. I think, okay. Uh, ICL is a good choice, but I, they didn't understand something. Uh, how we, after uh, the RK, we received uh, more myopia than before. And high astigmatism. Uh, well, but for ICL, I think it is a good choice. I already. Have the digest vision and vision will be happy, I think. Okay. Fine. So dark, right? Yeah, we, we did dark and mm -hmm. uh, a year down the line he had his sutures out and that's a, a year and a half after. Uncorrected vision is 648 
uh, pinhole is 67.5, and unfortunately, he's still not tolerating any contact lenses in this eye, so he cannot get his um, best uh, contact lens corrected uh, visual acuity. He's uh, mm -hmm. unhappy with the quality of the vision with the spectacles, and so we are back to square one, really, where we, are, we have an unhappy patient with his vision again. Um, however, gradually, what we realize is that his uh, vision is dropping, so now uncorrect is down to 660 and uh, pinhole vision 624. And on the scan, it appears that he's developing peripheral graphic thesia, 270 degrees. And so we're now facing a new problem, a uh, graph-related problem. So again, question here is, what do we do next? Why, why does he develop graft ectasia? Is it graft ectasia or peripheral ectasia? Is it, uh, in the, is it in the periphery of the cornea, his own cornea, or is it in the graft? So either way, that's, either way, after being cross-linked, I, I find that really unusual. Mm. Is so it graft slippage? I mean, uh, you get, if the grafts are not sutured properly posteriorly, then this mother with a DLK or PK, you can end up getting ectasia because of poor apposition. But it's useful to know exactly where the, where the ectasia is. Would you expect that Shiraz to be, if it's 270 degrees, would be from the ho in the host itself? I don't know. Usually, usually more sectorial and inferior, unless this is slippage. I thought this is, could be slippage. My, my, I don't know. Damien, what's your thought? I think you, you saw this patient, right? Yeah, I think I saw him at the time. I thought it was the host bed uh, got progressively thinner, particularly inferiorly, and the whole thing was bulging. But the actual donor tissue looks, you know, relatively okay. That's classic, classic poor suturing. If you don't go deep with the sutures, you've got, a, you've got a, an area that's, that's going to start getting ectatic at the graft or center face. Interesting. Okay, so now management of peripheral graft ectasia. This is a uh, very challenging. I don't think it's an easy thing to uh, to have or manage. Um, any thought, Dr. Anas? What would you do if you have this kind of two seventy degrees ectasia? So the whole graft is host bul bulging. Yeah, but it is. What about uh, stiffness of the uh, cornea? I don't have this information. I don't know if Artemis knows. I didn't hear the question, sorry. I was asking what the thickness of the interface. Probably he, he do you want to resuture, you mean, Dr. Anas? Is that what you want to do, resuturing? I think it depends about the thickness. If we have good thickness, we also we can put interstellar uh, rings. But if the thickness is uh, low, uh, we mm. should go for uh, BK. Yeah. Or L. Well, to be honest, I, I think uh, if this is a peripheral ectasia, I would rather address the ectasia issue first. Then we can uh, work on which yeah. Diameter? Pardon? In which diameter? No, this is uh, like 270 degrees. So the whole, like, almost the whole periphery, all ectatic, is not really strong. So the cornea bulging forward because of the thin periphery. Shiraz, what would you do? Would you do uh, dark or no, are you another dark <laughs> or suture? No, 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 I mean, the, the, the guy, poor guy is young. So we can't go for the... Uh, what I would do in this situation is that it, 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 I used to do a wedge resection for those because you've got excess tissue. What I now do is I, I revise the wound, but I make a tongue and groove. So I, I groove into the peripheral rim that's thin. And then I undermine the, the graft and it's, I make it sort of a tongue and groove and, and, and tuck in, which is what uh, uh, Rajpai discussed, the sort of tuck in procedure. And I'll tuck in that whole area and, and suture up. So what I'm doing is basically tightening up the wound, but I'm also preserving tissue. I used to take, do wedges on everybody. And I realized that the faces where the wedge would start, they start becoming tonic again. So now I just do this tuck in. And actually, it's very, very strong. So I always I usually wind up, wind up overcorrecting them. Um, but that yeah. works out quite well. And I use mostly in sutures to tighten it up. Now, with 270 degrees, that's a huge uh, amount, of, uh, amount of tissue. They do actually really well. It's the ones that you do the small sections and that they have very high stigmatism to begin with. But when you've got a wider area, they do quite well with this procedure. It's a, it takes a bit of doing, and you might mm. be perforating, but that doesn't really matter. As long as you're preserving tissue, 
and, th and thickening the, the, the host where it's thin, mm -hmm. you do quite well, long term. Sure. Is that what you did, Damien? If you show us the slides, uh, Artemis? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, so uh, Mr. Lake uh, did a wedge resection 360 degrees. Mm. Um, it's quite um, fascinating surgery. And uh, essentially, that's where we are now with this patient. This is the list of interventions that he's had already within four years of uh, treatment with us. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see he got quite a lot of things done. And essentially, it's just your thoughts on uh, what could have been done differently and uh, where we go from yeah. now, he's still unhappy. <laughs> so so, so the, 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 the cornea, I have to say, uh, I don't think you, should, you showed the, the topography because the, the cornea now, it looks much better. It's not ecstatic anymore. But to be honest, he's like back to square one where we started, which, which uh, <laughs> with the topography, Alan, you saw earlier, kind of the bow tie, which is not too bad. So it feels like we've gone into journey with these patients, ups and downs, and we back to square one where he was like six, what's the vision like now? 648 or six, something like that. So, yes. yeah, so actually after the um, uh, angular keratectomy, his vision uncorrected is uh, 612 in the last appointment. Excellent. So he's doing well, also just a still in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Countess blessing. And uh, I think the biggest problem is he's been led down a garden path in the hope of getting phenomenal vision. And that's what he's looking for. He's looking for perfection, he's fixated on it. And actually that's probably our fault as doctors. We, we're not being realistic with patients. And right now, I would, I would sit him down and say, you know, you thank your lucky stars you didn't lose your eye. And I talk about, I, t I tell patients, I get them all the time. I carry the colonist patients that once they start the, the, down this program, the, this pathway, they're like plastic surgery patients. They want more and more and more and more. And, you, and there's only so far you can go and you need to say, this is it, stop. And, and uh, you could be much worse if you could lose your eye. I mean, there's, yeah. there's certain things I always tell keratoconic patients before they're having surgery, if you're doing anything in order to improve their vision, which is that their vision will never be perfect. I always make that really clear. Um, and I also tell them there's absolutely no guarantee that they won't rely on contact lenses. If they're expecting to have surgery to make them contact lens independent and expecting to have normal vision, then, then you 100% guarantee they're gonna be disappointed. So they have to accept surgery knowing that they will re require a contact lens afterwards, you know, or at least you cannot guarantee that they won't re require a contact lens afterwards. You can never guarantee that. Um, and, you know, and that their vision will still be suboptimal. And in asymmetric keratoconus like this, I also make it very clear that the worst eye will, will definitely remain their worst eye. Now, it may be that you surprise them, and that isn't the case, but one of the benefits of being a refractive surgeon and also someone who does keratoconus surgery is that you're always used to managing patient expectations. And I think with keratoconics, they are a unique group of personality mixes, let's just say. You know, even outside of the learning disability and all the stuff that we know is associated, um, you know, some of them obviously are totally normal individuals, but many of them are just not, they're cognitively not exactly what you would describe your average patient as being. And I don't think anyone's really looked thoroughly at that. And maybe it's associated with habitual eye rubbing and anxiety and mitral valve prolapse and lots of other issues and dysautonomia. And, you know, there's probably a huge array of stuff that we don't really know and understand about. I sometimes unkindly joke with my fellows that they have ectasia of the brain, but they are not your absolute normal, you know, having managed them for over a you know, two decades now. They're really not totally normal, but you could get into real trouble. Um, I've had one patient who was suicidal on the, you know, I, he ha I did, I did um, asymptomatic keratotomies to try and revise high astigmatism a long time after initial primary PK surgery. He ended up with, um, you know, pain, discomfort, dryness. And he was, he was, you know, we literally had to get the psychiatrist in to come and evaluate him to make sure that he wasn't going to kill himself. Um, mm. But, you know, they are, they are, they ca it can be very difficult. Um, there was a study yeah. done in the University of Minnesota where I, was, where I trained 30 years ago. They, 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 we used to, you know, they, with respect to keratoconus patients, we used to call them coneheads. And we thought they were, you know, they were off, completely off the wall. So they did a study where they compared um, keratoconus patients with the normal population. But the, the, the study organizers said, forget it, you can't do that. You need to take another population, a second control, and look at, at, at kids who've had eye problems all their lives. And what they found, but they did all these studies, the Rorschach tests and the rest of it. And they, and they found that, yeah, you're right. Keratoconus patients are different, but actually they're no different from, from kids who've always, people who had uh, eye problems since they were children. They've got 
they've got over mother, they've been fixated on their vision, they've been coming in and out of doctors' offices, and they're they're very similar in terms of personality. And so Summer, I'm sure you can attest to that. You take care of pediatric uh, patients. I now have some that are that I used to look after they're now 30 years old. And uh, they're different. They're a bit like keratin patients. patients. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> Shiraz, Alon, very valid points. I think a lot of times do less is better, to be honest, with those patients. I have to be very careful. And I think this is a, a powerful message for, for all ophthalmologists and um, those who practice on keratoconus management. That is, we have to be think carefully before any intervention. Because um, like you see, look at the list of surgeries this guy had. And we, he's, he's better maybe overall, but I think it's too much for, for a small win, I would say. But uh, okay, thank you. Time is running. Sh shall we go for next case, uh, Artemis? Yeah. Please, yeah. So uh, this is the next case, posterior stroma scarring is the topic. So we have a 74-year-old male patient, again with keratoconus. Right eye, he had uh, multiple previous grafts, so he had uh, PK in the past, and then uh, because of uh, graft disease, again, dark over PK, then a wedge excision, then he do PK, but that's the right eye. We're focused on the left. Uh, he had dark there with intraoperative central microperforation uh, during big bubble, but the surgery was able to go ahead uh, anyway. But that's the first day after surgery, so he's got a double anterior chamber, and um, obviously the decision was made to, to rebubble with SF6. Um, his, um, yeah. Yeah. So can I ask a question here? When do you, and this for maybe sounds very simple and general, but when would you convert from uh, DALC to PK on the table? If you're doing, uh, if you're doing a DALC and then you have a perforation, would you continue or you convert to PK? I continue. I, we do, we do DMEX and DSEX. I mean, why, why would you take out that endothelium just because you got a hole in there? If I could accomplish the full dissection, I'll continue. Yeah, so that's a good point. So you do DALC, and then in future, you can still do DMEC or DSEC, right? So that's, no, no, yeah. No, we, we, we have a much, much bigger endothelial surface. We know it sticks to the, to the uh, uh, donor cornea. Why would you want to take it out just because you've got a hole in the, uh, uh, somewhere? We know we can seal it down with air and with a bit of pressure. So I would, personally, I, I, don't, I almost never convert. Okay. And this, is, this is a big open, you know, this is a huge tear. Like, this, yeah. is this one is a big one, actually, and it's quite central as well, this patient. Okay, sorry, Artemis, carry on, yeah. Uh, so following that, uh, obviously, successful attachment afterwards, he achieves a best corrected visual acuity with contact lens 612, and he's happy with that. But he develops a cataract, he's 70 plus years old, so two years later, he has cataract surgery. Uh, First post-operative day, he developed superior decimates detachment. So I uh, proceeded again with rebubbling with SF6. Um, at the time of cataract surgery, the sutures were also removed. The dulk sutures were also removed, just to notice that. And uh, again, successful reattachment. And that's his visual locality after that. So this is a cataract surgery in someone who had the dulk. I assume it's quite large dulk. Um, the question is, do you, when you do a, a cataract on a, someone who had a dulk, do you change the plan the way you do cataract surgery? Are you still doing clear cornea or you go sclera or whatever? Take Any views? Out. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious, you, you, but I usually just take the sutures out and use that keratometry to try and give them the best possible visual outcome with the, with the lens calculation. And I always go scleral in all these patients. Well, scleral. I do, anyway. Okay. Yeah. Good, uh, good point. Alan, do you do uh, scleral or do you go clear cornea if you need to do cataract? Um, I tend to go, I tend to go limbal, so I'm kind of going in between. I'm not, um, mm. you know, I, I think that you can with a with a limbal incision, a stepped incision, you can avoid the the periphery of the graft just fine. Mm. Okay, okay, fine. Right, next, please. Um, so that's uh, a year after all that. So he has developed some diffuse posterior stromal scarring. His uh, vision has dropped. So it's now uncorrected 660, best corrected 630. And um, uh, his rigid contact lens is not helping anymore. And uh, on the scan, you can see that he has developed this quite central on visual axis, uh, thick um, scarring uh, decimates and posterior stroma. So this is his um, uh, corneal topography. So you can see there's some, again, some high stigmatism ectasia as well. So the 
issues now are that he's got a knee drop in vision, he's got some decimates and posterior stromal scarring uh, with the peripheral graphic tasia, and his uh, RGP trial failed to improve his vision. So, so we try to see is this patient, okay. is the problem with the vision can be improved if we correct the cornea irregularity. So we tried hard contact lenses in a clinic and I did myself to see if I can improve his vision. So I tried various contact lenses, hard ones. He's not improving. And we, we felt that actually it's his deep stromal uh, corneal scarring is a problem. And the question was, how are we gonna remove that scarring? Because if you look back uh, Artemis to the, uh, to the OCT, so you can see this is, this is not just a decime, this is a bit more than decime. And my question to the panel, would you just do a DSEC or DMEC? Do you think that's gonna sort out his problem? Or probably we need to do more than that. I thought we need to do something about the deep stroma as well. What do you think? What about doing a, uh, a DLEC? Anyone, yeah. anyone got any experience of that, Shiraz? Use a femtosecond lens to do that, and that's what we have done. So we take I, that. That looks like it's involving the posterior lamella tissue, right? It's not just decimase membrane. Yeah. And you can from, the, from the OCTs, that the, the you can see this is slight irregularity of the posterior lamella tissue. So I would use a femtosecond laser, although they don't program them, they don't make them, so you can do it from the endothelial side up. But I would do a cut going from the inside of the eye uh, upwards, and actually, it's quite difficult to remove that. That uh, I mean, that's just a technique, a technique issue, uh, because you've got a cut going into the posterior stroma of the of the, the actual cornea itself, as as opposed to the patient's own cornea. Picking up the edge is not easy, so you need to go a little bit centripetal to it to find it, and and use a pair of inverted uh, tooth forceps to pick it up and then peel it off. Um, and you do that, you've got to, you know, I would just do a seven millimeter cut, or even six millimeters centrally remove that central area and put in a, a, a small DSEC uh, or a DMAC. And that usually takes care of it quite well. How, if, how thick would you go? What, what the tissue thickness you remove? Well, i will make sure I remove all that lamella tissue. So it depends what that, what that thickness is at the time. Okay. W would that button would stick well with bubble, with SF6 you maybe? Need, you need to get a reasonable amount of pressure in the eye to, to stick it up there. Yeah, they, but they do well. Mm. Mas Corsin described this as well in patients where he, he removed the central six millimeters um, and, and grafted the six millimeter button. Dr. Anas, you want to say something? Yes, but uh, I was but I think they didn't hear us. Uh, the case is uh, uh, all uh, not in the uh, uh, So in this case, Okay, fine. Uh, right, thank you. Shall we move to the next case then? So uh, this is the third case. So it's um, a 64-year-old male patient who six months before presenting to us, he was uh, admitted in ITU with COVID pneumonia. He was intubated and ventilated and he developed a corneal ulcer in the left eye whilst ventilated. And that was treated as herpetic keratitis. However, he had no prior history of uh, any herpes infection. Um, anyway, so he presented to us right eye unaffected, 6'6 vision, left eye 660 uncorrected and 630 with pinhole. However, reduced sensation in both eyes with Cochabonet uh, esthesiometry. This is the clinical picture. So he has uh, diffuse uh, stromal scarring, mid stromal scarring, and there's uh, quite a lot of thinning as well and um, irregularity. So if you check his pachymetry in the left eye, his uh, central corneal thickness is 313 microns and minimum thickness 272, so quite thin cornea. Um, and that's the anterior segment of CT as well. So I think the issues with him is that uh, he's got quite diffuse scarring, he's got quite profound thinning and reduced corneal sensation. So what are the options for treatment for him? So this is interesting because uh, I found the sensation reduced in both eyes. Yes, it's worse in the left one, but actually equally the right was, was reduced as well. And I was wondering whether it's something to do with the COVID virus itself. I don't know if anyone observed something like this, but very unusual, to be honest. Um, I didn't expect his right eye or the good eye to have a reduced sensation, but here we go. Um, so, so now this is a cornea thin, 
313 thickness, um, actually even thinner than that, and neurotrophic. So we know that doing keratoplasty in neurotrophic corneas is a challenge because they, they have a lot of trouble in healing, post-op infection, all that. Um, would you do something? What would you do, uh, Shiraz? Long after the, the original problem is this? So the, uh, he, he probably had uh, infectious keratitis when he was admitted in the IT unit, exposure probably and get nasty infection, the cornea left him with this terrible scar. Um, there is very little details from the uh, intensive care unit when that time happened, but I, that's what I'm assuming. I think they treated him as herpetic disease, but I don't think that necessarily was true. No, yeah, I, I suppose that my question is how, how healthy is he and, and how debilitated is he? And is he interested in coming back and forth to hospitals? Because if he's not, I would leave him alone. Yeah. So no, I, he, he, he's back to normal. He's, he's, he's recovering well. I think he has a bit of breathing problem still, but he's recovering well. Yeah, and plus I, I have tried to be as conservative as possible and allow, allow things to heal and let, 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 let things take their own course and eventually consider options. And he's, he's, he's neurotrophic, probably from HSV, but it's interesting when you say that he's got decreased sensation. I find that in the elderly a lot, they have decreased sensation in both eyes, um, often from exposure, not closing the eyelids properly and so on. Uh, I would leave him alone and wait for as long as possible, wait for the pandemic to end, and then consider options later. Because you know what? If you do a graft on him, he might need a tarsography, he'll need a lot of follow-up, and he'll be back and forth, he'll be hounding you in the clinic. Well, there's a potential of hounding you in the clinic. So I would try and be as conservative as possible. Okay. So uh, Damien, with us, Damien, would you consider something different? I was thinking of doing sulk for him, for this guy, for example. I thought it's, it's less invasive, probably recover quickly. Maybe we joint it with amniotic membrane transplant on top as well to promote healing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm still um, concerned that he's got any neurotrophic cornea at all and why the reason that is. I mean, did he have a neurological deficit when he was in ITU? Um, I mean, the... The outcomes for a neurotrophic cornea are generally quite dismal. So, I mean, mm. I'm sure as I'd be as probably as conservative as possible with this guy, considering his other eye is pretty good. Um, mm. I mean, if he really pushed it, then I mean, what what does the OC, what does the cut through on the OCT look like? How deep is the the scarring? Artemis, yeah, you have that right. Yeah, I mean, I, personally, mm. I don't think a salk is going to do that. I think. That's not going to work. I personally, I don't think it's going to work, but um, mm. I'll be interested to know what everyone else is going to say. I mean, I mean, if you were really pushed to it, say you didn't have another eye and you just had one eye mm -hmm. and it was the eye that he needed to see and he was really motivated, then I think you're going to, I, I would do a doubt with an AMT and a tarsography and plug both, mm -hmm. pump them at mm -hmm. the same time and tell him that it mm -hmm. was high risk. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he might have persistent epithelial defect afterwards. He might end up in the hospital for a, a month, he might get infections and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But um, you know, I would, I would leave it a long while. I, I would think and, and see how he acclimatised to what he, to what he's got and what he's living with first, and see if he could cope with just one eye first. Sure, I'm not sure it's Alan here. I want his thought on this one. Um, are you here, Alan? Let me get himself a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah no, would, I am here. I've, just, I've, gone oh, get, sorry, yeah. I've gone to get breakfast, which I've not had time to do. So that's why I'm... Oh, I, sorry. Okay. I've got to yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I heard what your responses were. I mean, I, yeah. I don't like intervening on, um, on neurotrophic keratopathy patients unless they have a persistent epithelial defect. So I kind of feel that the main indication for intervention is to prevent further loss of vision um, rather than visual rehabilitation, because I just think they, they do so badly and the chance of complications... And making things worse is is so high because you're unless you can take away the actual cause of their problem, which is the neuro, which is the fact that they're neurotrophic, um, the problem is going to recur. Whatever, in my opinion, the problem will recur. Whatever you do, it's why I'm interested in hearing about your neurotization experience, Samir, because I remember when Asif Ali um, did the first human trial several years ago in Canada. I was very intrigued with it because I find these patients to be. Um, a nightmare in clinic. I mean, they're very, they're probably the most challenging and there are many of them. You know, it's not, it's not rare in neurotrophic keratopathy. It's probably 
in my opinion, the commonest cause of severe corneal disease for which there's no you know, real that, 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 can, that can improve them. So yeah, I'm interested to hear what your experience was with, with the neurotization. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Yeah, well, actually, this corneal neurotization, which we, we've done a good number of patients so far, and uh, I have to say the outcomes are the trophic function restores in almost 100% of patients. Not everyone will get sensation back, but we're looking at the uh, ocular surface parameters. And I think I agree with you. The, the, probably if I want to approach this case, uh, we don't basically for unilateral cases. If I want to approach this case, I will do corneal neurotization first to ensure that actually we, have, we are working in a safe and this patient has some decent corneal trophic functions. And then we probably do a, a sulk or dark or whatever required. But I can, uh, I can share my thoughts with you separately as well later on if you wish. But we, we really have a very good outcomes and I, I, would, I would continue to do it. Now we, having, we have to pause a little bit on doing those cases due to funding issue, but it's nothing to do with the surgery itself. But I have to say, it is, it is one thing that is a cure for the patient with corneal neuropathy. And I think this is one of the things like when you come, uh, if you think those patients are really difficult to manage, they come with recurrent infection, ulceration, et cetera. So this is a one-off procedure, which just actually keep them safe, to be honest, and reduce the number of procedures they're gonna need in the future. But thank you for asking. Uh, right, Artemis, shall we quickly, do we have time to, to finish the last case? It's a quick one, uh, actually. So if we have yeah. To go through that. yeah, let's do it quickly then, please. Yeah. Yep. So last case, a case of Therian's marginal degeneration, a 47-year-old female patient, left eye only affected by it, and it's inactive disease at the moment. So right eye, uncorrected vision is 6.6, left eye 6.48, and pinhole 6.30. There is a degree of amblyopia in this eye, but she was achieving previously uncorrected 6.24 and uh, correct, best corrected 6.18. However, she's intolerant to... Uh, contact lenses to rigid contact lenses. So this is the clinical picture and this is her corneal topography. So she has quite high astigmatism, 11.4 keratometric astigmatism in the scan. Uh, now this is the anterior segment of CT, quite a lot of thinning and scarring, uh, superiorly more affected and uh, inferior temporally as well. Um, obviously she's uh, at the age that she's developing some very early lens opacity. So at the moment, she's uh, obviously suffering from high regular astigmatism. She is intolerant to uh, contact lenses and she's experiencing a drop in her visual acuity and uh, she's experiencing also quite debilitating night driving glare. So that's her main problem at the moment. So what would be the options for management for her? So interesting, I'll just say for uh, contact lenses, um, just to, to be fair for, uh, for the vast improvement in contact lens fitting, I think there's a lot of now custom-made contact, sclera, contact lens or mini sclera, which make difference to those patients' life. And I think I would personally prefer conservative options if possible. Um, I'm not sure if this, this could be the case in this lady, but with the customized contact lenses, that you can achieve a, a better vision with minimal invasive surgery. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a challenge in this case. This is a kind of more peripheral issues here. Can we ask Damien? Because you, you, the expert in the peripheral corneal <laughs> scar anesthesia. <laughs> Am I? <laughs> well, looks um, like it. you're managing them very well. Look, looking at that cornea, I would, I would not do anything to the cornea at all. I mean, it looks like there's, there's not a win to be had there. Um, mm. Although the periphery is really obviously affected on the photography, the OCT sections show sort of more central disease as well. So I don't think the optical quality is ever going to be any good. I mean, if, if she's got good vision in the other eye, I would try not to operate on this left eye. And if I did, I would, if there was cataract, I would do the cataract. And then if there's still glare, um, you know, I could, you, you know, we tried pinhole lenses in the past and I don't think they're available anymore. But as a, as a substitute to that, you can just give a unilateral pile of carping. Mm -hmm. Give her a, would give you, her Damien, a would you use a turret paper. lens? No. No. Uh, Alan, would you use uh, uh, something like uh, IC8 lens, something like those, like the uh, AccuFocus or those with pinhole lenses? I've used, I've used the IC8 lens in um, patients with irregular astigmatism after keratoplasty, which you might argue is not too dissimilar to the kind of topography that you just showed on this patient. Um, the problem is some of her symptoms, I think, are, are nighttime 
driving related anyway. And one of the problems with the IC8 lens is that they do get dysphotopsia at night. So you might just be replacing one dysphotopsia with another kind of dysphotopsia. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, if the patient's really desperate and they consent to it, um, you know, you could try it if it, if it was difficult. I've, I have explanted IC8 lenses before. They're not that difficult to explant. You know, they, they mm. just, um, they, they explant like any other lens. So um, it's, mm. it's something that you could try, but again, it wouldn't be guaranteed. It's a difficult case. It, it, in, my, in my experience, it, it improves irregularity by about two diopters. So here you've got 11.4 diopters of astigmatism. Mm. You, know, you might make a 20 or 30% better. I, I don't think it's really gonna, gonna solve the problem. I have, I've never done it before, but I have heard people describe um, lamella um, segmental keratoplasty in these patients. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose it's something that you could potentially try in the inferior segment there where she's, where she's flat. Would, would a bit of uh, PRK will, a combination with IC8 will help now? No, it's right. too much, isn't it? Clinic, no, 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 central, central, just the, around the, the uh, five millimeter zone. The area that's ecstatic, I mean, that's, that is the problem. And either you address that uh, one way or the other with the contact lenses or, uh, and I've done them, I've had a whole graphs in these patients, uh, but I need to be, I need to be, you know, I need somebody to convince me, twist my arm hard to do that. And she's got in both sections, usually it's one section, although the area that's most ecstatic is the area that's the biggest, but there's no question that, that if you want to do, if you don't want to do a heroic, then that's what it's going to have to be is a, a, a horseshoe graft. And the two tips on horseshoe grounds that I can give you right now is that you better put in mesaline sutures because when you take them out, they, they start to ease up again. And you need to make it shorter. The, the length, the, the width of the horseshoe has to be shorter than what you've got on the cornea. You've got to bring it all up. It looks like hell afterwards, but over time, it remodels and looks quite good. But the patient needs to understand this. The vision is going to be much, much worse to begin with. It's going to, probably going to be like that for about three to six months. And then it'll start to ease up, maybe with some selective suture removal. If they're not prepared to go through that, then it's probably not worth doing them. Remember, this has evolved over time. This has taken a while to get there. It didn't happen overnight. Um, so I find these patients are not that pushed to get anything done if the other eye is good. And if they're not pushed to get anything done, I don't do it. But I have done patients with Syrians with good results. But I've seen them ease up and get six diopters of astigmatism again, only to have to do a tuck-in procedure to improve it, uh, maybe 10 years later. Sure, what's the process here? What, um, what's happening, happening at the structural level? Is it inflammatory or yes. traumatic? So, or what sort of medical treatment do you put them on in the long term? Well, have you noticed that, I mean, this is an observation myself and Jesus Marayo Yoves and a few others, around the world have noticed, noticed that patients who have terriens, if you look at their eyelids, well, what tipped it off is they, they often get chalasia. And you take a look at their eyelids, they've got, they've got myeloma gland disease and they've got low-grade inflammation. This is a bit, a bit like a, and I've seen acute ones, I've got pictures of them in a patient with, with, with terriens in both eyes. And he came to see me acutely with peripheral ulcerative keratitis and bad lid disease at the same time. So, well, you know, actually, this is probably what's related, that, that lipid is, is lipid from vessels. The thinning is from peripheral ulcerative keratitis problems. And you can see in the, the distribution of this particular patient is quite classic. It's where the lid margins are. It, so I believe, and I'm, not, and I'm not alone, that this is a lid disease problem. Treat the lids, uh, whether you treat them with, with long-term antibiotics, uh, topically or orally, uh, get, get them on omega-3s and uh, warm compresses, maybe even IPL. And I've done that on, on these patients, and it seems to have arrested the progression. Um, but you never know. I mean, you need to, we need a study to be able to demonstrate that. But I believe this is inflammatory. Uh, so if I see it in one eye, I make sure they start treating both eyes uh, in terms of lid disease. This is a little tip. This is what I've observed over the last two or three decades. Thank you. So certainly we learned a lot of good tips today. I think tip number one, don't do surgery unless it's absolutely necessary. And uh, also, as you mentioned in the last, case, the last couple of cases, actually treating the etiology, if there's ectasia, manage the ectasia more than manage the astigmatism, these sort of things. So try to get the, the, the root problem and address it before just jumping on other, unless surgery is better. Right. Do we have any comments from our uh, uh, host, uh, the uh, Syrian Society? Yes, 
sorry, we can't hear you very well, uh, Dr. Anas. The vision was a six by six. Yes, 660. Sorry, uh, vision was 648, unaided. Uh, 648. Yeah. And there's a. Uh, this is a very different device. I'm going to the break. This is very, very good. For this case, uh, we sometimes speak good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, Oh, okay. Right. What, what do you think of my panels? Yeah. This is what uh, my colleague uh, asked. This is the question. Which is easier treatment than the other complicated Is it the practicable? You hear me? Yeah, I'm, unfortunately, I can't hear you very well. I think the question but is whether amniotic membrane would be indicated in this case. No, amniotic membrane would not make anything. If I uh, amniotic membrane is it's to healing active uh, inflammatory ectasia, maybe if anything happening, ongoing active disease. This is a long standing uh, deformity of the cornea, and uh, we can't do anything about it. If it's active disease, then yes, there is a potential to use amniotic membrane or other things. But uh, yeah. Nothing. Okay, I think we're running on time. Uh, yeah, I don't want to take much of your time. I know you have a meeting to continue. Um, I just like to thank uh, my panelists. Thank you so much. You've been a great, and thank you for your time on Saturday. It's not easy to take your time from your family and your work, but I really, really appreciate your contribution, and I'm sure my colleagues in Syria they really value your input. I mean, I have to say a nice word. The the, uh, the ophthalmologists in Syria, they, they're really practicing in extremely difficult, uh, um, what do you call it? It's <laughs> on various levels, there's a challenges, but they're still going and they're still having their own meetings. They're having their own conference, as you can see. So they're really keen to continue the, the message and help their patients. So uh, thank you to our colleagues in Syria. Thank you for having us today. And thanks for my panelists, Kurnia club panels today as well. <laughs> uh, you've been great. And thanks, Arthur, for preparing all that uh, for us. And uh, I hope we, we meet again in future meetings as well. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Dr. Samuel. It was very, very nice. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, many times on